Peter nods. One's reward. Yes, be deliberate with what costume one puts on and make sure it fits, holding all the exploded parts inside of barely. Makes me think of a mom's maidly routine I found on the internet who says, diverting how awake or not awake we are. Trying to help me expand my thinking, I thought. Jackie, mom's maidly, a stand-up comedian, veteran of the Bodville Chitlin circuit, an opening routine with the Count Basie Orchestra in 1962. I know you'd rather smell perfume and liniment all the time, especially that Sloan's. All the perfumes in Arabia can't beat that Sloan in me. And Cap, Cap, I like that boy in the band. Which one? That little drama. Oh, you let that young boy alone. You kid me. Let him alone. That's right. Not as long as I can make $50. Only way I'm going to let him alone is for you to fire him. And I'm going to fire him. Jackie, listen to me, please. What, well, honey, honey? When I first came out here to introduce you, all that big build up I gave you, told everybody you was my love, now you going to tell me something about the drama? Let me be your love, but let me take care of that little boy, please. Nothing but a baby. What? The baby. I like babies. <laughs> oh, my goodness, can I like me that boy beats that drum. And I got a old beat-up drum. I was thinking he could kind of... Thank you. 
name is Rasim Jelani. I'm the director of community programs at Mammoth International. And welcome to Mythologies of Diva, uh, which is part of a bigger program called Triple Consciousness, which is a three engagement series to really talk about uh, black and young identity for black families. And we're here on the occasion of the long table discussion. Long table discussion is not the traditional panel, some people may call it a flip panel. And what we do is we have a group of discussants at the table talking about a particular topic, but you're also the panel. So do not be shy. It's very important that you're not shy. And what all I ask of you is to come to the table if you have a, a burning question, comments, or want to join the conversation. And please do not have conversations in the audience because that's not what it's about. It's about bringing you here. And it's full democracy. All voices, opinions are valued. No one is wrong. No one is right. It's just an opinion. Right? Um, so some etiquette for the long table discussion. It's a performance of a dinner party discussion, right? So we're all performers for this uh, performance. Um, in order to join the discussion and sit at the table, you can leave the table at any time. Um, and if the table is filled and you want to join the, the conversation, you must have someone on the shoulder and they leave and you take your seat. The only people that do not leave the table are discussants that are planted here on this side. Um, we will have hosts that will, once it gets a little crowded at the table, we want to kind of control the flow and track it so it's not totally anarchy. Um, we'll have myself, who will be a host here, another host here, and a host in the back. And when you're ready to go to the table, it's filled. You go to the host first, and then we'll give you the prompt to go to the table. Um, the other thing I want to say is please stay on topic. Um, even if you go off a little bit, we'll try to get you back on topic, but it's really not about your bio or what you've done in life. Um, you know, the history of it. Keep it pertaining to the conversation. I know a lot of people have a lot of things to say. Um, and also be mindful of participation. And this is kind of a microcosm of life, is be mindful of other people's participation at the table. It's very important. Some housekeeping. Um, this series was produced by Map International, 651, and Brooklyn Museum. Brooklyn Museum has been putting together this type of discussions to engage the public and ways to really keep the conversation moving forward. Um, Map International, 651, have been in the center of putting thought leaders, who are the artists, in the center of these type of conversations that's going to push them forward, implicate the community, and change the solutions. And that's what we're here. Um, so please, um, join the discussion, and now I will introduce the curator of this series, and we go and we'll give you a vision of why we're here and where this is going. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Awesome, awesome, awesome time. Very challenging, very rigorous, and um, really enlightening. Um, so I'm glad to be here. So when I thought about uh, this long table, I immediately began to think about cultural practices where black women and girls have been coming to the table, coming to the porch, coming to the backyard, you know, coming to the garden to have critical conversations about what's going on in our lives. So we, we are calling this the long table slash kitchen table conversation. Um, and on, on, on topic uh, for today, on the menu, is this idea of divaism. And some of us know what this is. Some of us know about the diva from a very kind of um, curated space. But today is an opportunity for us to get inside of that and to trouble that and to think about you know, what are progressive ways to, um, to embody this identity or change it and flip it around. So um, I'm excited for us to, to get into the messiness of this conversation. We are oftentimes dealing with the whore Madonna complex, bad bitches, bosses, and all of these 
reconstructions that come out of performing performances of black female identity. And it's time for us to dig into the origin of these identities and their, as well as their current constructions. I'm most excited about the open chairs and I want to really show you that these chairs, although they're turned facing this wall, you, if you need to turn around and say something out here and not just to people here, like this is our living room, this is our kitchen table. So feel free to embody this space in an empowered way. Um, I, so I'm most excited about the girls and the women and the folks who, who bring questions up here. The panelists have been prepared when you have, well you have, with your, with your lifestyles and your life experiences. So we're, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Um, and I'm actually excited to think about redefinitions and re-examinations and reclamations and shedding of, of stereotypes and ideas that don't suit us. So this is a very hot button topic. We think about what's going on in the world today. Some of these people on the, the, the wall here. If there's another slide, you know, I would love to, you know, just let people see the, the way these images have been crafted and what do we think of a diva when we see these images. So it's time to talk about this. Time to get into the messiness of it. Don't be scared. We're going to have a good time. Okay? Thank you. Our moderator for today is none other than Shani Jamila, an artist, traveler, and the director of the Urban Justice Center's Human Rights Project. Her career and studies have taken her to more than 35 countries, a journey that is reflected in her community work, media commentary, writing, and creative production. Her work has been exhibited or performed at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, the Phillips Gallery, Corridor Gallery, and City College of New York. A Fulbright Fellow with a graduate degree in Africana Studies, Shani is a frequent public speaker about African American culture and identity. Please check her out at shinyjamila.com and at Twitter at shinyjamila. Please join me in warmly welcoming our moderator facilitator, Ms. Shani Jamila. Camila Janan Rashid. 
is a conceptual artist working primarily with photography, installation, and text. She deems herself an artist archivist, which I think is an extremely important thing to have in our culture. So let's please give it up for Camille. Do we have any CNN watchers in the audience? <laughs> That was her. <laughs> that was her. Amanda Seals is, has written, produced, and started for One Woman Shows, and she recently held it down yes. in a conversation about street harassment on CNN. Please give it up for Amanda Seals. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we have Adaku Bhutan. Adaku is a community herbalist, liberation educator, Liberation educator, can I just sit for that? <laughs> yes, ma'am. And performance artist, she is the founder of Solar Bliss, and she helped get us all centered before we walked out into the space of DS, and I feel like the ritual of breathing is centered. So let's give it up for a time. was, you know, the, the woman who, when she's on the stage, she's the one you're watching, you know, she's the ticket drawer, she is the, you know, originally it's the head soloist of the Opera House, you know, the Maria Callas, you know, and, um, and so that was where that came from. I wanted that when I was on stage, you knew that this is the line, um, for lack of a better explanation. Uh, but, but then it became to shift, it, it began to shift when it now began to mean that diva meant that you were, you know, negative and demanding and uh, disrespectful and, you know, let's just be real, a bitch. Uh, and that started to become an albatross around my neck. Like before I would even go somewhere or be considered for a job, they'd be like, oh, well, I don't know if we want a diva here. Whereas that I had the name for the purpose of like, of course you want a diva, it's a diva, you know? So, um, so yeah, I just say that to say that, you know, there's, there's several definitions, of course, but it's interesting that, and that's why this panel is so relevant, is that uh, over time, the, the, the definition of the diva as a powerful woman has become deconstructed to mean that powerful means that you are negative. And uh, I think there's a lot of folks to blame for that, and part of those folks are the divas themselves. Because do you really need white doves in your dressing room? No. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of interesting to me because I think that sometimes uh, power, when um, like a black woman is presenting it, has tended to be negative. From the point of time, of course, that suggested that, you know, what was this in the 60s and 70s, that um, the, the, the death of the black family or the position of the black family is like a um, weakened position had to do with the dominant and powerful woman. So I think any time we've had power has been associated with our bodies, it's always been kind of contentious and, and negative from, you know, like uh, being able to walk through, uh, taking care, being able to have a baby in the field and get back to picking cotton, you know, it also kind of connected us to something that was um, pre-human. And, and so it's always been a kind of a complicated space, I think, to enter or has that baggage with this diva 
might apply to our audience. Um, I'm just responding to that. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> um, when I think about the word diva and the ways that it's embodied within uh, mainstream pop culture, it is often uh, embodied within a, a cisgendered woman, woman body, um, someone who speaks English, someone who is heterosexual, someone who is rich, someone who um, is in the entertainment industry and has a certain level of social status, um, someone who is from the West, someone who is of a particular body size, someone who is able-bodied. And um, as a queer Nigerian working class woman um, who moves to this country uh, almost 20 years ago now, and thinking about all the different communities that I work with and um, our reflections of me that the term diva, the, the mainstream um, definition of the way that it's embodied does not fit all of us. It's obviously, like you mentioned, um, a term that uh, is, is limited in its, in its form of expression. So okay, whenever people occupy, they can only occupy so much of themselves. And um, those different identities that are connected to divaism within pop culture are very much rooted in these normative, patriarchal um, ideas of what, val what is valuable, what is beautiful, um, and what is powerful. And uh, I think we deserve more than that when I think about the, um, the definition of diva that I want to occupy. I'm excited that we're having this conversation because this, this conversation is an, is an act of decolonization, um, which is an act of resistance, which is an act of love. And so we get to, um, love ourselves in, these, in this really powerful way and um, bring ourselves to the forefront rather than um, feeling like we have to perform in these specific um, boxes that don't serve us at all. Okay. Um, and thinking about diva, I sort of mind uh, my family's history and my own personal history, and I think that diva growing up was used as a term to sort of police myself and female family members, right? So this idea that you're actually uh, diva, you're believing in yourself too strongly. You are um, acting in a way that is too self-possessed and too confident, and diva was used as a term to sort of police your behavior so that you could be less confident, so that you could be um, more in line with expectations of what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a black woman, and just generally what it means <laughs> um, what it means to learn how to take a back seat. Um, and so a lot of diva, I think, embodies a lot of positive characteristics of owning yourself and owning your narrative and, and being self-possessed and going for what you want, but I think it's also been used as a term to police um, a lot of women's behavior. Um, and I taught that I was in schools for a decade, I still work in schools, and I, diva is a term that's not used towards black students, um, female students, but it is a term that has taken on derivative uh, terms that are not diva um, that are also used to police. Um, and so I'm really interested in thinking about definitions and the ways that language can police, but ways that language can also sort of free us and allow us to occupy spaces that we've been told we can't occupy, but also so we can break out of binaries. And I think there's a way to be confident and self-possessed and not have a preamble before you win an award or have a preamble before you take a confident pose. Um, that needs to be more welcomed um, and engaged with, especially for black women who are often told that even if you win a prize, even if you are successful, you still should be quiet and polite about the way that you express your success and your confidence. Um, I, um, I like Davis. <laughs> I like the I like the I, the received idea that we have of this this grand dam who is fabulous and um, who owns her space and might be a little bit hard to deal with. Um, I like the freedom and the permission in that, um, and I I I love hearing everything that's been said about thoughts around that and how it can be impressive. And I, I, I'm so glad that we're having this conversation too, but um, I guess um, my headspace is always at more in performance and ideas of performance and like just permission. And it's just fun to me to be all the things that people say that they don't want 
and to be all the things that people want and they don't know that they want or they won't admit that they want. Um, and I don't have any preconceived ideas of what that can look like. Divas existed before we had a word for them in English or in Italian. Um, and I don't know, I, I think what, what, what we really mean when we call it that word as opposed to any other word, um, it is this um, kind of like, I don't know, I, I kind of think of it gesturally a little bit, like, you know, this kind of, you know, whatever that is. Yes. Like, I love that, whatever that is. Um, and I'm, I'm glad it's in the world. Is there something we can do about the sound? There's a ringing. I mean, is this a diva moment for me? <laughs> So I, um, I do think that the whole idea of the diva is also someone who can sort of make and construct a space around themselves. So I think you talked about claiming space. And I think that it's really um, fantastic to think of a woman moving through the world, particularly a black woman, right? Shaping the space around her because I don't think um, there are a lot of spaces for us to move in publicly that we have shaped ourselves. So the idea to me too about a diva, of a diva is, is that kind of thing. Um, but it's true that power and um, femininity, specifically in the cisgendered way, seem to, in, in a Western patriarchal sense, um, are, are supposed to be uh, are conflicting things. It's, a, it's, a, it's an oxymoron or paradox. So I think that. Um, that's the thing that a diva does, right? She exhibits um, a kind of power, almost a, 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 a relentless, a, a fearsome power, and then also a kind of uh, vulnerability, right? So when we're thinking about these opera singers, there's something about them that is incredibly powerful, but at, at any moment they can kind of break or come apart, right? And then they're always putting themselves back together again, just in time to to, to, to break again, right? They'll come so apart on you. They, they will come apart on you, but they're coming and apart you have to on with Right, and they're coming apart on themselves. And so there's also this space of, this idea that uh, like a woman kind of in public, um, building and tipping and tearing herself down and everyone around it kind of storm almost, you know? Um, um, unpredictable, unreliable, un you're uncertain. And, the, and that idea is that, like for performance, that's a powerful place to be. I mean, I'm a performer, or some of us are performers, but I love that space of being in between coming together and, and, and falling apart. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, in your waking sort of pedestrian life, interacting with various modes of power and having to present a kind of uh, a personage, like what is your, the projection that you have to send out into the world to survive. And diva, the label diva in respect to that is much more complicated than that's what we're going with. That's what I have to contribute to. I wanted to, go ahead. I just, I wanted to take a moment to affirm what you just did with the sound. <laughs> oh. And claiming that in the diva moment and the act of naming what you needed at this moment is really powerful and I think um, something. It's what we all needed. It's something that we all needed, uh, right? We all heard it. <laughs> I was like, my ears are ringing, and it's, it's hurting me. And stop it. Absolutely, and I really appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciated that that act of humanness that you named, that was housed in you naming your needs, and how um, how I, I, I want to see more of that leadership. You know, the the capacity for us to express our power in naming what we need. Because oftentimes, there's, there's a myriad of ways that our lives as black women are acted upon um, and controlled and vilified and punished. And to be able to walk into a space, like I think of artists who come into a space and they have a rider. You know, they're like, I need these particular things in order for me to be able to perform. And what would it look like if black women were able to walk into any space, into their relationships, into their schools, into their jobs, into their communities, and say, this is my rider. 
You know, in order for me to live in this community, I need to have access to healthy food. I need to have access to a healthcare system that does not misgender me. I need to go to a school that does not automatically put me on a pipeline to prison. Like, what could that actually, what could that actually look like if we are able to walk into a space and exert that diva ship in, in naming what we need and what we deserve that is actually in alignment with who we are? And then channeling that diva ship, right? Letting it infect the masses. <laughs> And how people really listen to us, like because you know, like you were mentioning, that's the power. Whether people want to or not, they have to listen, right, um, to a diva and what she's saying. And so, um, even though I think oh, that's complicated, that can be really complicated. But just like in terms of reimagining, imagining the kind of world that I want to see, <laughs> I want to see folks being able to evoke this diva ship where they're able to name what they need and. Um, design the spaces, co-design the spaces that they want to exist in powerfully. But I also agree, if I want a diva, I also want like all of the complexities. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. And so there's also the diva imperative as a performer, yes. and then the one in the world. Because I think as a performer, sometimes we don't see enough perspectives. I don't see the roundedness of the experience. But anyway. There's so much beauty and complexity and nuance and what we've already said in just these introductory questions, and what I'd like to encourage, as this brother just did, <laughs> is to have, and I'm glad that you did, thank you, thank you. Welcome space, is if you would like to participate in the conversation, come and join us. Come and join us. Uh, hello? Can, can anyone hear? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'd rather speak without the mic. Uh, we're live streaming. We're live streaming. Oh, you're live streaming? Oh, you're live streaming. Oh, so you need to. Can you hear me with the mic? Okay, cool. Uh, so my name is Mark Paul White, um, and I, I'm inspired by this whole movement, and I really think this is what is needed um, in society at this moment. Uh, but I do have an, an issue with the whole concept of the diva. Um, this is the very fact that we need the title diva for a woman to be a woman. Now, what's the opposite of a diva for a man. The very fact that you, you, you claim that isn't going to be too diva of me, and you said, I appreciate this diva-ness, and, and her power to just announce that she needed something. It, it almost seemed like she needed to put herself in this title of a diva. And it seems like in this whole presentation, we're fighting to take back a word that shows a woman has power. I am a diva. Why do you have to be a diva to be powerful as a woman? If I walk the streets and I'm powerful, I'm considered a man. But if a woman is walking the streets and she, can, she considers herself a diva, she is a diva, secondary, a woman. That's my only issue. Well, with that's a strange <laughs> assumption that you're making. That they do. <laughs> somehow inherently within the diva framework or that, uh, that, power that yeah, I mean, because we're, what we're saying is, I, but I did say something about like women and diva being somehow, like women in power, the idea of women in power is, is, is something that everyone has to, we're still learning, True. but I don't, I didn't necessarily mean to suggest that me acting like a diva, I mean, I was even joking. Because I feel like I saw people wincing. And so it wasn't just about even my power. It was just trying to address, like she said, something that I felt people needed to be on me. But I didn't necessarily mean, I don't think that the two are separate and not in intricately uh, connected. But I think that's a good question about well, what's the man? Like, why is it just a man is powerful? I, I totally believe that diva is entwined with one. I mean, a diva is a woman's possession. I will never be a diva. I can claim myself to be a diva. RuPaul, RuPaul. I was going to say. RuPaul, yes. Come up to the table, brother. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Understand that RuPaul, he is a diva, and I... But it doesn't erase other things. No, it doesn't, it doesn't. But I had a conversation with somebody the other day with someone, when we're having a discussion about uh, breastfeeding and it led into pregnancy, and the new term now is queer pregnant, incorporating a man into pregnancy. Now, throughout history, and I myself as a man, 
And I cringe at this whole history of men and women is that how many things do you have personally that you can claim for yourself as a woman without a man already stepping on your pedestal? If you think of sports, it is a man thing. A woman in sports is it's okay. something, it's something Let me just right. interject for a moment if I okay. may. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because, because you're saying a lot. And, and I see a lot of reactions to it, and I want to allow the space for some of the things that you're raising to be addressed. So um, if those of you who are, would like to. I feel like your intentions are good. <laughs> Like I, you know, like if we're if we're sensing energies, I don't I don't think you're coming from a place of you know ignorance or malice in in, in that space. But um, I think that you're coming from a place of perspective. Like when you say you know when a man is a man, he's considered powerful. <laughs> That's not accurate. You know, like I don't consider that to be. And I feel like there's probably a lot of individuals in here that may share the, the thought process with me that like that doesn't inherently encourage the other, you know? And th in the same way that, you know, being a woman doesn't inherently just mean you're powerful. I mean, you know, I think sometimes too, we get very, very, very general, you know? And uh, there's also like individual character that comes within, that comes to that, you know, that speaks to that. As for sports, you know, you just said sports is a man thing. That is just sexist, like, bottom line. Um, you know, the, the idea that sports is a man thing is, is part of, like, the everyday examples of sexism that are so ingrained and indoctrinated into our culture that we, let me talk, that we, uh, we now then somehow feel like we are just a part of that. But honestly, like, sports is not a man thing. Like, sports is a sports thing. And people participate in it, whether they are men or women or disabled or, you know, transgender, et cetera. I mean, it's an activity. The problem is that it's considered a man thing, you know, and so that's part of the change. But, but I do understand what you're, what you're saying, and I, I feel like you're coming from a place of wanting to empower. And I, I actually thought for a second, just a second, but I did think for a second, uh, what you said, which was like, well, why do, why does the word, why do we have to have a word to describe like a powerful woman? You know, like why can't that just be what it is? And for me, like I do feel like um, I have always associated diva with a, with a performance space energy. You know, and then it has it has then you know permeated into our whole world. And then you were speaking just on like a working class level, just on a day to day basis of being a diva. Um, but I think that's, that's what this whole discussion is about, just like claiming terms of power and identity. And at the end of the day, I mean, there's just no way to blanket all of that without it inevitably sounding sexist coming from a man. So let me actually ask the next question because it sort of bridges from what you just said, which is when we look at our current cultural climate, what is the value of a diva identity? Yeah, I just, I'm sorry, I know we're moving on, but I just have to say, I'm sorry, she's gonna, she's gonna have to moderate me, actually, sorry. I think that he was saying it's all about what is projected. I don't think he was claiming that idea. I'm, I'm jumping in for you. He wasn't claiming the idea. But my issue is that, oh uh, my gosh, quickly, my issue is that the we is, a pro is problematic. That's what I find is inherently male, right? That, that th this idea that, like even for pregnancy, if women are now saying we're pregnant, you're saying why can't they have anything, right? Why can't they claim anything and have anything to be their own? And I'm saying actually, perhaps the whim, the woman, the, the idea of womanness is that you don't need to claim it for yourself, right? There's something very masculine about saying this is mine, this, this is yours. Whereas, or maybe, maybe the, like it's, you know, maybe the way that we can start moving towards a uh, kind of uh, 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 a distinctly feminine ideological position is to assume uh, less of a binary or um, a one person owns a thing, claims it, and then you get yours and you get, you know what I mean? I feel like that's where we could really be expansive, right? So, I, 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 I,
quick statement. Um, I want to say this in a defense because I, I came up here not with the intention to present myself as a man or seem sexist. I came to only use my voice, my own opinion. The, the example I made of sports was only to, to just showcase just the, the general things that we associate with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that is the reason that we're having this discussion. Because Diva is a general thing. You know, you think of anything, you would an associate with something. And I think our usual associations doesn't really show the true portrayal of something. And I, before we, we go on, and this is gonna be my last thing, I do still believe and this is why I came up here. I do still believe that the very fact that we're we're discussing that a woman is a diva, you know, and that is associated with a sense of power, and we're trying to reclaim this title of diva to associate it back to power, strong sense of women. I think that is the issue. Why do we have to? fight back for a title if we already know that we're strong. I claim no title, and I believe I am powerful. I didn't just come up here as a man, I came up here as a voice. You, but men you, have like, you could be a boss, you could be a job, you could be exactly, like a player. Exactly, you know, but that's, like, the, like, thing. that's like, the thing. That is the problem too. That is the problem too. Okay. You're raising a question that really begins to delve into the historical constructions of, of womanhood and historical constructions of manhood. What roots us and why is there a need for any kind of assertion if we, if we use that kind of frame that you're positing? But isn't that why we're here? Absolutely. I want synonyms. <laughs> But I, I, I want synonyms, I want language, I want as many words as possible to define a, pow a powerful woman, you know? So if, if, I mean, I don't see anything wrong with defining that. I think that, you know, the beauty of language, especially as a linguist myself, like you want as many words as possible to use to get your point across. So just saying woman, that's cool, but it's so much more flavorful to have all these other options and to have diva as an option to say, to define a powerful woman who knows her space and who defines her space, et cetera, et cetera. I want that option. I think it's fun. Well. Sure. And let me just say this. I want to thank you. I'd like to thank you for troubling the waters, right? That's one of the things that you said that you wanted us to do, that this is not a conversation where we're all necessarily here to agree with each other. That's not what a, what a kitchen table is, right? So I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you gave us to what can say. And I welcome anybody who would like to join us in the seats that are around the table. Then it can seem like 
oh, you're making this assumption, oh, you're doing this, you think this automatically, and um, which may not always be happening. And it's so funny because, you know, I've been thinking about the whole cat call thing, and there was like, in my Facebook community, there was a showdown about um, what are we gonna, um, what are we gonna um, do about this? Are we gonna get mad at this, or are we not gonna get mad about it? And I was like, yes, let's let's get mad because it's it's in my life. But um, <laughs> at the same time, I, I, you know, I was walking down the street today by myself, unaccompanied by my husband, and uh, you know, they were coming, and there's a little bit of like. Oh, I acknowledge that someone wants me to have a good day, but I acknowledge also that on a dime I could turn into like, bitch, I said have a good day. Um, and I don't know, there's just like, there's so much, there's so much gray area in language and then the intention behind it and the culture around it. And um, I don't know, I just, that's kind of what I'm thinking about while we talk and what we say and what's the intention behind, like, good intentions, like, really, if you really have good intentions, like, what we feel, and just the spirit of, like, you know, if this person is sitting at my kitchen table, that means that we broke bread together, and I'm, I'm glad that this person is here, and, you know, it's all with, uh, you, I don't like what you're saying, but I, I love you, have some more, have some more. <laughs> So on that note, I'd like to welcome the voices that we have at the table now. Please let us know what you'd like to contribute. Uh, when you spoke about two times Please speak into the mic because we're live streaming. When you spoke about uh, this conversation being really academic, I was thinking to myself, I, I work with teenagers. I, I work at a high school. And when I think about my girls who are divas, like this conversation would be up here, and they're just thinking about a diva who is a bad bitch and who just takes what she wants, says what she wants, does what she wants, without regard for anyone else. Right. And then, so how do we address that? Like, it's great to be a diva. But if, you can't. You were joking. It was great to be a diva to say, listen, let's turn these mics down. OK, I'm being a little diva-ish. But that is for the community. Uh, yeah, I totally right, right, joking, right, right, totally get it. But then, you know, some of my girls, I won't characterize all of them, you know, it's just about what I need, yeah. what I want. And then it loses that whole um, community because it, it'll come from a selfish place. Because if you don't know who you are, to kind of say with the, to, to, to address what the young man said, if you don't know, if you don't have a definition of what woman means, um, then when you equate woman with diva for what popular culture is, then diva is just about you doing what you want and not really caring about anything else. And it's the opposite of what the definition of woman might be. And I, I want to jump in on that, because one thing that I keep thinking about is how there needs to be a multiplicity of our understandings and iterations and ways of being. And so I want to let young women own if what they're becoming and growing into is being a woman who takes what they want because that's what they want without regard for anyone else. I want to own that as a place that they are at that particular moment. And if they grow into someone else, they grow into someone else. And if they don't grow into someone else, they don't grow into someone else, right? So how do we allow black women to exist in multiple iterations mm -hmm. while, it, while acknowledging that maybe it may not be as community oriented and, and collective as we may want, but how do we, what, how do we, uh, how do we make space for all of us to, to exist um, without complications, without having to ask permission to exist in that way or without, um, without challenges in, in the fact that we are at this particular moment in the process of becoming. Because at this particular moment, I may be a particular way, but I may become someone else in the future. But even if I don't, that in some ways I'm trying to figure out how is, how is that still OK? But that's guidance. I, I was going to say, as, a, as an educator, I, I agree with you. Half of me agrees with you. Mm -hmm. The other half is like, but my girls are hurt girls, hurting people, yeah. and hurting yeah. themselves. Yeah. And those actions yeah. of being a diva. So they're, they're, yeah. they're engaging in, ris in risky behavior for themselves. I mm -hmm. that action of being that. And it's coming from a real sense of hurt. So while I want them to be themselves, mm -hmm. they won't necessarily grow by osmosis. It needs some sort of explicit instruction into Context. how to kind of grow. Yeah. I agree, and I'm an educator as well. So this is the one of the issues that I often come up against is how do you nurture someone to facilitate this growth?
wrote without it being a directive or being a form of discipline. Absolutely. 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 And so thinking about our pedagogical approaches to nurturing black women in ways that actually nurture them and give them the opportunities to develop into who they want to become. Because there may be some women who say, like, after I've, after I've heard all of this and actually facilitated all this conversation, after I, I've seen all these different iterations of being a black woman, I'm still making the choice to be who that is, who, who I choose to be and who, who, who I am at that particular moment, and how do we make space to acknowledge that we, we can't shift everything, we can't shift everyone, um, how do we make space for that to happen? And I'm thinking about pedagogical approaches that allow for nurturing and not direct discipline and policing of black bodies and black women, can, can which, is, which is hard. Can I, I, I so many different comments now. I do want to say something though now on this, because out of all what was said, what comes out to me was, and not care about anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I don't think whether you're a black woman, a black man, a white woman, a white man, a Chinese, or someone from Mars, mm -hmm. you should be encouraged Absolutely to become a person Absolutely. who does not care about anybody else. So if we're saying we care about these young girls, then our job is to guide them yes. as we are women. Absolutely. And it is not proper, you, you, you don't judge somebody by guiding them. Mm -hmm. I have nieces who came to me and told me things that they didn't tell their, their mom. Absolutely. Because I didn't make a judgment about them. Mm -hmm. You right. understand humans are humans that don't make mistakes. But still it's your job to guide them. Absolutely. These are the consequences. Some actions are good, some are bad. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's all right to say, um, Nothing about Absolutely. caring about no one else or even, even encouraging that. Now, I do want to make a comment on the diva issue. And first, I want to you know, commend the young brother, I forgot his name, yes. Jesse, the bravery it took. Because I had a brother, he had five sisters and a mother, and to sit at the table with the seven men. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is he really at any stage? So, congratulations on that. But on this whole thing about diva, I saw Lena Horn, I think, in one of the pictures, and it made me think about her stand-up show many, many years ago. And her dad said, well, you can just stay in Brooklyn and be a maid. Why are you going to Hollywood? Because the only jobs were to be a maid or a prostitute when you were a black actress. So the concept of the diva, Rita Franklin, and everybody kind of developing that personality was understood it had a purpose. Yet, what I feel today is that it's just like overused, it's so yeah. superficial, it's, it's nonsense, it's, it's like a, a wrap around yourself to present some false image because we are so, so overwhelmed with so many images that we can't get a picture of, of who we are. I think the young man was correct. For you to be a person to exert power or authority in a position particular position, there should not need to be this title, especially one that has a connotation. And by the way, even for the soprano, it had a negative connotation. And there is no such equivalent for males. And the same thing happens in corporate America when the woman is the boss. I mean, they call her the B word. So it's all about being able to exert authority and to make decisions and to demand things that you need to demand and there shouldn't be this need for Dima. But I understand conceptually, which is why I used the Lena Horn example, made a prostitute, why it came to be, why it may have been needed as a vehicle at a certain point in time, but I hope we move past that time. So from there, let me just pose this question to the group, because one of the things that you're talking about is you know, how we're identifying even as a womanhood, right? And there's the, you know, when we look at pop culture, we pop culture, that's what this panel is about, right? So one of the most popular songs about demons is that Beyonce track, right? A diva is a female version of a hustle, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's unpack that. Sort of the gender assumptions that are embodied in that. Is that what a diva is to us? Let's decolonize this word. Somebody mentioned at the beginning of the conversation. Let's go in. Actually, um, I had a question going right off of that. Um, just thinking about not only Beyonce, but just how womanhood and divaness and feminism is being portrayed in the media today, and like how we're using this term diva and feminist as like a pseudo marketing strategy rather than actually reclaiming the word and just saying like, oh, this is you know popular representations of what a feminist is, and like how does that differ from our own definitions? You know, what are the problems in unpacking like 
media representations of a diva versus like what we think it should be. Right. Excellent. Whoever wants to take Hello, my name is Nisha Shabazz. Um, I was sitting in my seat praying, should I come up here? Because <laughs> I wanted to stay center. But you know, okay, I want to say a couple of things. A, we're having this conversation, let's be very clear, we're not talking about women, we're talking about black women. And I just had to say that, that was really in my spirit because there is a difference with that. And then sister, what you were saying about, you know, when we're having a conversation, you know, let's say it like this, that is another preconceived notion about black women. Because I bring energy, because I'm hype about what I'm saying, it's like, oh, don't say it like that. Maybe that was not your intention. Maybe that was not your intention, but that's how I felt. Because I am a real loud black girl. I talk for a living. I'm a publicist. I'm a producer. So I understand the energy that that comes with. You know, and I've had people tell me all my life, tone that down. So if we're having a conversation about black women, this hypeness is very necessary. And to the brother, I, I, give, I give you love and praise for coming up here. But some of those things, we're kind of sideways, and I'm over here like burning up. So that is, that is, that is necessary when we're talking about black women and perceptions. That is very real. And what you were saying about the young people, I get what the elder said. Yes, we don't want to just let them be in that place. But what we do want to do, and I was thinking about this, we want to send them supreme love and light. Because we know how what happens to sisters who start off young like that, and that keeps going. But I say all that to now. I have a question for the man. Okay, so that was not in vain. My question, can we bring this back to black women? And how this looks, diva looks for black women, because I'm, I'm not pumping this at all. God is my witness. I just got this dying my first of her book. Yeah, I'm happy to have this book, but I'm not pumping this with no love. It's about Diane Von Furstenberg, and she's talking about how powerful she is, how she go all over the world, she's a boss, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow, she has a freedom to do that because she is a white woman. So let's bring this back, and I swear this is divine that I'm reading this book on my way to Brooklyn Museum. Let's bring this back, back to black women and diva and how that looks in the corporate environment, the nonprofit environment, because we are talking about black women. And that was kind of why I came up and started talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to say it. You got to say it. <laughs> started talking about teenagers because my black girls who are divas, it is not received well by anyone, by other black girls, by society, it's not received well. And so we're here having this intellectual conversation about all the ways that diva can be received well, but when you have black skin, are those ways still there? When you're poor, when you know, when you, when, when, you know, my school's across the street. Old Prospect Heights. So when you're in that situation where you're coming through metal detectors and you're a diva and you're ready to pop off at any point, how does diva serve you? I mean, but it has been very relegated. I feel like there is a racial distinction between the way it has been defined. I, I did a show where one of, the co one of the other performers on the show was a white woman, and she was demanding that for her wardrobe, she needed to have all uh, labels, like major, you know, fashion labels. They needed to all be samples. They could not be out in the, you know, out in the streets. Like, no one could have been wearing them yet. And they were like, oh my God, like, she's a diva. When I was like, I need some extra shoes because I can't wear these black shoes with this pastel fit. It was like, you're being extra. And it was like, Wait, so, oh, slow up, you know, like, how am I being extra by demanding what I need? And so that's why I feel like it is important to say, like, no, this diva thing can be ours too. Because it is, it is very inherently something else when there is a different color attached to it. And part of the reason, like, my breaking point of taking diva out of my name was when I saw an article that said, Stacey Dash fired from single ladies for being a diva. And I was like, and then the article described all these ways that she was just horrible to her cast members. And I was like, well, dang, I mean, that, that's not how I've seen Diva described as Celine Dion. That, you know, that's not how I've seen Diva described as Barbara Streisand or to Ben Midler. I can go on, you know? And so when I see Patti LaBelle, that's a Diva to me. You know, that's not, she's not a diva because she's wildin'. She's a diva because she's got her reason, she's got her power through skill, through time, through perseverance. And our young women, I feel, don't understand that that is a way of being a diva. Not by just being like, this is me. But I, I just wanna, I wanna insert that, you know, we're making a lot of generalizations about black young women. Yep. And as an educator, that's, 
I know. I'm, I'm just, I'm just. Some responding. of us were black young women. Absolutely, absolutely. And as somebody who's, the, as, a, as an educator who is, who considers young people as my teachers, as my prophets, who I am constantly learning from how to be better as somebody who has been hurt from, um, from systems of violence that impact my own life. I think it's really important that as, as we're talking about you know, black young women, not to problematize them, and then also to act as adultist um, folks who are the only ones with information or the only um, space of guidance and the only space of information and resource. Um, and really think about how can we create a space, how can we co-create a space with the young people that we work with that really allows both the adults and the young people to really tap into the authenticity of who they are and to be able to tap into the powers that they have in a really real way that does not oppress anybody in the room or in the circle or whoever's in that space, but really honors all of us. But why does guidance have to be oppressive? I, I was gonna say, I'm trying, I'm sitting here taking deep breaths, trying not to say it personally, because I didn't come here and I, I made no example of how I work with my girls. I simply brought up an idea about some of my girls. And then it was like, oh, a lot of women have space. I have a women's group and I do a lot of just listening and having a soft face. <laughs> the video the other day and I got a call well I guess I don't know you anymore <laughs> and I'm like I'm 33 what are you talking about you just caught me the whole damn time and I'm like no I didn't. and I had to explain to her what took place because I wasn't conning her like no I had sex one time on January 8th 2000 that was the first time you know and like she had yeah I was not in your house but <laughs> You know, I, I, as an adult, have come to understand, though, that, like, th she gave me all the guidance she had to give me, right? But as I was sitting down, like, that wasn't, like, I got books on a couch one day, yes. you know? Like, that was my guidance in that space. And I told her, I was like, listen, like, I understand that you had what you had to give me, and, like, that wasn't a part of what you had to give me, and I as I've grown as an adult, like I want to be able to give that to, to the young women that I know because I felt like I could have benefited from some guidance in that space that I didn't have. But I don't think there's a lot of distance between what you two are saying. No, I think we're saying. The question is not about whether or not guidance should be in place. It's just simply about how and where they come up with their own knowledge. And who is in control of that guidance. Let me just, I want to make sure that we we have space for the other folks who join us at the table to come into the conversation and then Camila, please. Good evening. Um, um, is this one? Okay. I don't need the mic, but okay. So, okay, okay speak up. All right, so I will project. So, I'm Dr. Lani, and I am just very pleased to be here. Um, I'm pleased to be at a kitchen table in the Brooklyn Museum, and I, I want to put emphasis on that because as we talk about how Diva is represented in popular culture, within our own communities, our work with young people, we are at a kitchen table. We are not in the public media. So there's conversations that we have about what DVF is in the public and we talk about that one way. And there's another conversation when we talk about it amongst ourselves. So even trying to define the whole role of how DVF is used in the media, to me that's a different conversation when I, I will speak to it on a different way. Because a diva, I have been defined as a diva. I do not define myself as a diva. One of my best friends said to me, you keep running from your diva hood. That is just now how I accept myself. But I am mindful that there are a lot of young women who see me as a diva. 
There are men who see me as a diva. There are women who see me as a diva. And each one of those people see me as a diva for their own understanding of what that word means to them. So there might be men that see me as a diva and one once almost had the nerve to say, because I'm too much work. So his idea of a diva is a woman that required a lot of work. Some young people might see me as a diva, some of the young girls, like, yo, doc, she don't be taking nothing, you know, she running things or whatever, you know, so, so everyone has that different notion. So this is what I love about being at the kitchen table, is that this conversation, and whatever math is this my first one of these is doing, I love it because it's teaching us the tolerance. These are not definitions. I, as the gentleman said, right? It's an idea, idea, idea. And us resisting the need to have to add any value to it other than listen. Because a diva doesn't care what <laughs> Barbara Streisand is called or whatever gets called. Because when you're a diva and you define your own term, it's how you define it. So I don't define myself as a diva. But I can tell you one thing, that if I allow someone to refer to that term and associate with me, I will break it down for what it means and the kind of people that I am. All right? Yeah, I just wanted to double back quickly to the conversation around guidance first to make sure that the woman who just stepped off the stage, that remember your name, but just wanted to clarify um, that I wasn't making assumptions about what you do with your students. Neither was I. The only thing, the, the, the thing that I keep thinking about is that you probably are the only person in their eight hour school day who is having positive conversations about their identity. And so my point is not about you, but it's about all the other structures that those girls are gonna come in contact with during that day. So those 45 minutes that you have with them is extremely powerful, but I'm thinking about all the other ways that every single day in their day interaction in the class, walking through metal detectors, they're being policed and disciplined and being told that the way they exist and who they are at this particular moment is wrong rather than being told that they are people in the progress process of becoming who have the potential to become other people. So that was my concern. The other roles of discipline that don't have to do with you, but that they still come in contact with every day. And I think that goes back to that point before. I have to build a society where women, girls can walk into any space and assert and say, this is what I need and want at this particular moment without that being too um, overwhelming or too, um, being too self-possessed. And I think that's a, as an educator, that's the thing that I constantly go back to, how our schools are not structured as nurturing sites for girls, black girls in particular, I would say black girls exclusively, to, to exist as humans. And I feel like this conversation around deepness is not about like a certain power, it's about asserting a baseline of humanity. Because everything that we're talking about here is like saying like, if I need the mic to be turned down, I'm going to say I need the mic to be turned down. But it's also like growing up, when you, if you were a diva, that was you asking for a baseline of humanity. You saying that actually I don't want to walk down the street and have people call me out my name, that's not a certain power. That's saying I'm a human being and not an object and I should deserve to be free as And so I, I, I do want to sort of shift the conversation to think about humanity and not so much power because before you even talk about this idea of having power, we still need to be conceived of as people who are humans who deserve humanity. And that's, it becomes a human rights issue, not an issue of of, of daily engagement with whether or not I can get what I want when I want it, but can I be treated as a human subject with subjectivity and not as an object being moved in place as people so choose to move in place me. Exactly. And we trouble the idea of power too. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. absolutely. But I, I also feel like, um, I don't know when people talk about conversation getting too academic. I'm not necessarily an academic, but I, I, I mean, I, I, I hope that wasn't, if that wasn't preference to me. I'm offended. But anyway. <laughs> I meant to offend you. Okay. She didn't mean, she always wants to offend me. But I, I think we have to trouble the idea of power, you know, and, and we have to suggest, and, and how do we um, show women frameworks of power that aren't Diane Furstenberg and, and flying all over the country? What kind of power is that in the service, and in the service of what? Her own, um, her own wealth? her own accumulation. I mean, I think that how do we show women and young girls that um, uh, models of power that are like freaking Harriet Tubman who used her invisibility against um, the people who um, made her invisible and thought it would be uh, uh, something that would keep her enslaved when it actually empowered her to go back in the Underground Railroad and, and, and find more people and bring them um, to freedom. You know, I, I feel like women aren't, Beyonce is not enough. 
um, um, Lil' Kim or what's her name, Nicki Minaj, that's not enough. That's <laughs> like that other gentleman said when he sat here, let's talk about how the media is, is, is mm -hmm. packing and projecting these terms and throwing them out into the world and, and um, half the time we're just taking them on and, and, and buying things. Like, so, so how do we teach women and young girls that Power is not just about what you, you can accumulate and, and then how you can deploy that accumulation to project um, some kind of status. So let me just throw this out here because I thought it was so interesting. As I was preparing for today's conversation, I Googled diva just to see what would come up. And then I said, let me Google diva black women. Sometimes that's what we write right. 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 No, so I'm getting my mind right. I'm like, okay, this is going to be a bad idea. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to see, you know? I Googled it. Let me tell you the first thing that came up, which I thought was so dope. There's a woman, I haven't read the book, but I love that it exists as the first entry on Google. It was a woman named Kimberly Brown who wrote a book. Let me just, I have my Amazon right here. <laughs> Writing the Black Revolutionary Diva, Women, Subjectivity, and the Decolonizing Text. Right, right. Okay. So just in terms of like, okay, Google. That's very diva to do, right? Like, and you insinuate yourself into the conversation in a way that reclaims what it is that we're talking about and this is what we say. So I also like, to just go a little bit deeper in terms of, you mentioned Harriet Tubman, we also had some pictures up on the wall before we came to the table, you know, where we can invoke some of the ancestral ideas of what diva might be for black women in particular. Hi, I'm, um, thank you, Amanda. My name is Lachette, um, I'm actually a feminist blogger. And this actually um, was intriguing to me because my perception, I'm 29 years old, my perception of a diva is not Nicki Minaj, it's not Beyonce, it's not Lil' Kim, it's Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Felicia Rochelle. But I'm one of the very few in my generation who actually think like that because everybody wants to be a bad bitch, they want to have the banging body, and like you were saying, we're not humanized, we're um, objection, have yes. So that was, I back there burning up like, you know, I see the pictures of Nicki Minaj and yeah, she's successful and some of her stuff is good, but her anaconda doesn't. Like, I, I just, I don't like Rosa, I feel like Rosa Park was a diva of herself when she said, nah, I'm not getting up, my feet hurt, I'm gonna sit here whether it means I have to go and sit in. She was a part of a collective. Yes. Her choice to do that, that show was Yes, so I wish people of my generation would actually Get that, and that's what I try to instill in some of the girls that I know. But it takes things like this to actually get that across. Because it can be both, you know. Like Rosa Parks and Nicki Minaj can both be deep. Yes. Yes. you know what I mean. Because it all at the core comes from the same place of you ain't gonna move me. Exactly. All right, I'm gonna do what I need to do right. right now. And I think that it's it's great what you're saying because they're they're. You know, I still stand by the fact that like, no, we do need to define diva for black women. Like, I do want that word. And I don't want to have to be a part of that in a negative connotation when others don't have to be. You know, I want access to it. I like the word, it's cool. And, <laughs> and, and, and I, think it's, 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 I think it's important though for us to, just like you said, like to identify that like, this is not just about an entertainment thing. It's not just about, like being that bad bitch, you know, which, why? Um, but it's about, it's really just about owning your space and defining your space. And there's something to be said for like the amount of, like you have to have experience and time also and like guidance to even do that. I think the problem is when the women who, I think the problem is when women are claiming diva who aren't doing the action of it, you know? They're just, they're just putting on, I think you would say, like they're just putting on this like, Someone, I think someone said, we've had a very, a very flexible panel here. But, you know, just this cloak of like, oh, because this is the look. I just you know, know, yeah, okay. you know. And, I, and I, I mean, I commend that because I understand why you want to be that. But we want to encourage that, you know, there's also action and like foundation in that that speaks to what power really is. And it's not just saying I have power. It's exuding it and being rooted in it, you know. I, I think you visit, not you visit. I just want to put on the table not the idea of capitalism, but the existence of capitalism and what it means to think about um, owning space and taking control and empowering oneself and to say that um, 
we get what we get and we, we have power over that within a system of capitalism and how we understand femininity and feminism within a system of capitalism, which means that we can profit and our currency is in selling these ideas that don't always have any substance or content to them. So I'm really interested in thinking about like, we're, we're using this term like what value does Diva have in this contemporary context, which still revisits this idea that we have to place, um, that we're placing value and that we're, we're sort of bartering in this idea of what it means to be a feminist, what it means to be a diva. And I think it's, sometimes it troubles me to think about um, to think about this within this context of capitalism in the ways that we are selling identities and profiting and empty identities and the ways that people who are choosing not to buy into the system of exchange and value are excluded from these conversations. And that's why the precision of language is so important to me is because someone brought this up, and again, you know, it's like, we, we, I don't know who said that, we collect all these things. <laughs> But someone made a comment about the precision of language, and I'm a proponent of precision of language because I think one of the things that has happened historically that has made it impossible for us to, to make sense of ourselves or to assert ourselves as individuals and as a collective community is the, the continued uh, broad use of language um, that sort of obscures our humanity, right? So I, I think it's important for us when we say something to be intentional about it and to use precision in what we're saying because again, we are just gonna keep multiplying this process of saying like all women, all these, all, but it's like even within black women, we have trans women, black women, we have queer women, we have all these different multiplicities that we need to pull apart. So as we continue even thinking about how do we make sense of not just cisgender straight black women, but how do we make space for everyone else, and even young women who didn't make it in here because they may not have had force an hour, or didn't make it in here because they don't know the book museum exists at all. So how do we make space for these conversations that happen in here, but also outside of that? But how capitalism has a role in preventing conversations between people who need to have conversations with one another. I think that's very interesting. I was the one who uh, brought up the language thing. I just, at the same time, I feel like there's a privilege in language and knowing Absolutely. the right language and, and having done the homework or whatever, whatever book you got it from, whatever school you went to before you came here today, Absolutely. to be armed with it. And, um, as I've been more and more in these spaces, and sure, I went to school too, and you know, um, sure, I've read critical theory and like run my brain thinking about things in a very precise way. Um, you know, my husband is French, and uh, sometimes he doesn't understand when my mother writes him, sock it to me. He's like, your mom said, suck it up. <laughs> you know, but, so it really teaches me, like, you know, there's, um, I don't know, just what, what the privilege is and the way that we speak to and just my whole thing was not like, don't be loud. I mean, I feel like be loud or be not loud. I, don't, I can be totally a black woman without being loud. And that doesn't make me at least a black woman. Um, and I just, I was just thinking about, like, how we invite people into this space. And, you know, I have my own comfort levels of like, oh, well, if, if we're not saying it the right way, then, then no, 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 no. At the same time, I, I, I'm thankful for the people that do the work and get the language more precise and, and teach us like what cisgender is and what makes us think more about like, Oh well, I'm a I'm a woman, woman, you know, or whatever, you know, like whatever we're using that's clunky and awkward, and uh, I just I like to have that moment to acknowledge, like I may not be getting at this the right way. Help me, thank you. But here's what I want to say: still, I still have a place to to talk from whatever my thing is. Let, let, let's work it out. So I'd like to welcome the new voices to the table. And as I give you space to come to the mic, let me also just say um, that, as you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, this is being live streamed. And there are some questions that are coming in from our live stream audience. So I'm going to throw those out to the panel and um, offer you space for the mic. There are two here. Where do you see the diva in the future? One question from our live stream audience. And then, what does a diva think of sugar daddies? <laughs> Is that a real relationship? Can we have a question back? Is that a serious question? <laughs> okay. Do with that what you want. This, this is
is not at all about sugar daddies. Uh, uh, good afternoon, my name is Jumatatu. Uh, and among other things, I'm an educator and I'm a performer. First of all, I'd like to say that it, it is very like, thrilling to be at a kitchen table. Can you come a little closer to Oh, me? sure, sure. It's really thrilling to be at a kitchen table here with these brilliant folks. I mean, like, I'm just, yeah, I feel really jittery, so thank you for, for, for this experience. Thank you for setting this up. Um, I, I wanted to, um, in, thinking, in thinking about language, uh, which seems necessarily a part of the discussion of the diva, um, and, and, I, and I'm also thinking about the idea of reclaiming, re, reappropriating language, and, and I think particular, uh, particularly with respect to being within capitalist structures like Camila was talking about a moment ago. Um, there's, I feel like I've always had an agitation with this, uh, the, and with the idea of reclaiming language, um, especially uh, uh, as, as, as has come up before, you know, language is really powerful. And I think one of the reasons that I identify language as being really powerful is because of, la language is really powerful here, and I think that that has a lot to do with the, the structures that we're within, you know, capitalist, white supremacist, patriarchal, I think that those, the, the ways of identifying, the ways of, of utilizing language, I, it seems to go hand in hand with a lot of those structures, which, which, I, which I problematize. And I don't want to assume that it, you know, everybody here is doing that in the same ways. But I'm wondering, in the beginning, I was wondering about you know, these, uh, what is the, what's the potential power for imagining new words, you know, maybe, maybe there are new words that, that could be offered as, a, as opposed to or as an alternative to, you know, reclaiming these words that, that are already in existence. But then, you know, beyond that, I was also thinking about, again, back to that role of language, it made me start to, to question what is, is, is that the most valuable thing? What about other ways of learning? What about other ways of, of, de, of defining information of, of uh, oh man, I, I took notes on my phone, but anyway. Uh, uh, other, ways, other ways of identifying communication patterns, other ways of, of, of forging community that maybe aren't centered around language. And I, I was wondering if, if you all had any ideas about what those could be. I mean, I think that this, is, this seems like one of them, this, this placing of a kitchen table here and what that does. I, I want to respond to that um, and call into the room my, my grandmother and my mother. Um, so I'm from the Igbo tribe in Nigeria. And before a child is born, um, <clears throat> the, there is conversation and there's ritual about who this child um, needs to be in society and what kind of power they need to invoke. And they think about, the community thinks about the name that the child is given. And my name, Ada, who Ada means first child, that's a girl, first daughter, and Aku means wealth of good things. And I was told at a very early age that my power comes from my name, and that my name, every time somebody says my name, it's, it's like a magic spell, you know? And that every time somebody evokes that name, it evokes the power that I have, and that it been passed on to me from my own ancestors. It been passed on to me from the stars. And so I think when I think about renaming and humanity, um, thinking about you know starting with our names and starting with our hearts and starting with our spirits. You know one of the one of the very first exercises that I that I do within um, the educational spaces that that I have with the young folks that I work with is is going around and sharing our names and what does your name mean? And if you don't like the meaning of your name, what do you want your name to mean? You know, and how do we make sure that this name articulates the kind of world that you want to envision and walk with and move with and is in line with the commitments that you have for yourself and is in line with the commitments that you have for your community. So how can we um, introduce and encourage you? Because, you know, I think there's a space, there's space in that where people find power in those labels. And then there's also spaces like our own names you know, and our own ancestors' names and, and, and what they were able to do in our communities that evoke that power that are not normative, 
you know, but are so essential and are such incredible medicine in us healing and in us, um, yeah, living the kind of life we want. Hi, my name is Khadija, and I wanted to add on to what you were saying, as well as the sister that said she works with the young um, ladies. I wanted to say, in terms of being defined as a diva, we have so much reality TV going on, you know, that they get the perception that they have to rise to be this superhero in order to be acknowledged. But then when you look at it from another aspect, they may be a diva of their family. They may have beaten the odds of teenage pregnancy, domestic violence, drug abuse, the list can go on and on. That, that's what gives them their Wonder Woman types, you know, and their bracelets that they need to wear and armor up in order to be able to function in society and be accepted. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when the teenagers are acting out, it's not always out of conceit. You know, everyone is writing their own truth, and we all have a story to tell. So sometimes if, you know, you just sit down and listen to them and give them a little more time, again, without judgment, and you listen to their stories, their mom may be incarcerated, you know, um, they may not know their dad, you know, it's just a lot of things. And we're also living in a generation of the crackheads' grandchildren, and they come with a lot of emotional disturbance, you know. They were born to no fault of their own, but this is what we're tackling. When you see the robberies and the populace being snatched, they slept on an aunt's couch, they slept on a friend's couch, they need a hug, you know, they need a rub down. This is where it's all going. So a diva doesn't necessarily have to be someone who has an Ivy League education. They just may have beat the odds in their own truth. Absolutely. Hello, I'm Carrie. Um, hi, I'm going to be brief because I have to get back to my technical duties. However, um, I love this idea of our own names and our own power out of what we are naturally born with and what our truth is. Um, but also, what's coming up for me is the word diva just seems small. It just, it just seems small, it seems boxed in, it seems like it's passed down with so many different flavors and connotations that I'm less interested in the diva, I'm more interested in the queen. I'm more interested in the woman who, is, who sees herself and sees others as royalty and as as spirits and lights that are evoking this energy of just a quiet, somber, just love and respect for themselves and for others. That's what my 22 years has taught me, even though it has meant a lot. It, I just, I'm not concerned about the diva and the smallness of this, um, this character. I'm concerned about the big, broader, how do I see myself in others and others see themselves in me? And that is the, that is where it is, and the root of that love and light of being a queen and just admiring yourself and others. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to put that word on the table as maybe a possible alternative to something as small and as um, mixed, <coughs> mixed connotations as a deep um, But not everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tanya Noel. I'm, uh, please come closer to the mic. Um, uh, I'm Tanya Noel. I'm French. Uh, I'm running a non-profit in Paris uh, about the uh, uh, race gender issue. So I'm 27, and I want to talk about the, the to know that world diva have, uh, not being classist because uh, I'm hearing some stuff here uh, from people come ask questions when they kind of bother me because um, I have a little sister, she's 20, I'm running a non-profit, I'm graduate, etc. But my sister is 20, she's not graduate, she's not running nothing, but she she can be able to be a diva too. So uh, all the stuff about make the comparison between, I don't know, Marie Scondé and Nicki Minaj, I know the places where they tied for black women. I know the places where they where they, where they tied and we are a lot and we but maybe if we we invent a place like that it's for everyone can can be in this place. And I'm talking about the black woman uh, writer, black woman not degree, black woman sex worker, incarcerated, and, and all the black women, disability women, all the women, trans women, all the black women can fit inside because we can what feminism just put away uh, the black men would with the
misogynoir put away. So I just want this place, Diva, uh, be about you all, this, uh, all, all of us. And I want you to take this world for all the people I fight to in France, all the sex worker, all the people, uh, women of color, sex worker, because a, a lot of people live with the work of all these sex workers, all this beach stuff, etc. All a lot of people live uh, because of her. So just want to take over. Excellent. Thank you. So this actually feels like a good transition moment for us to go into our closing statements. And what I would ask um, is that as you close out, we have another uh, question from our live stream audience that you can possibly incorporate into what you say, um, which is where can we continue these conversations? So April, we'll start with you and then just come all the way down, if that's okay. Uh, where can we continue these conversations? Um, I, I would start around us, like our peers, our, our, our family members, um, um, I don't know, in the, in the grocery store, like, um, you know, what I, what I, another, like, uh, intellectual buzzword that's getting out there more and becoming more mainstream is uh, microaggressions. And uh, I think it's great that, like, people are starting to name those little dangers, like, eh, that, that didn't feel right. Um, and like have a name for that and like give validity to it and not like, is it just me being sensitive or me being a diva? Uh, but no, there's, there's something not right in the, the tiniest exchange that I can't name, like the way that you assumed that it was okay to walk right past me when I was the first customer here. You know, like I say, let's, let's start, start there. If it's not like, you don't have time to have a kitchen table conversation, but like, I don't know, it's a way to speak back to that moment, in that moment, and not um, let it pass. Um, uh, that's, that's where I, I, I start. Yeah, I, um, first I want to say it's been a pleasure to be here with everybody and it's quite exciting and I hope the conversations do continue, but I personally feel like in my work I try to keep these conversations going, which, and the conversations are um, uh, really um, attacking or undermining any sense of a binary or any sense of um, one person having to only possess one characteristic. I mean, you know, I, I, I feel like, um, I'm interested also in the diva that is the thunderstorm that is tearing everything apart and, um, and, and building it back up. I think that sometimes, and too, as a teenager, as a young woman, sometimes you have to break and then rebuild. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't know, um, I don't necessarily know how that functions practically, but I think we need to teach, um, I would like to teach my daughter and I would like to keep teaching myself that I am still forming and that it is okay to be vulnerable and to come apart and there is something after that and perhaps it is in the strength of coming apart and rebuilding maybe that's the ultimate divaness that's some that's I, that's that's um that's interest that's an interesting place for me personally so I echo the gratitude. It's, it's been a pleasure to sit here and listen and also to share. Um, something that comes to mind right away as somebody who identifies as a healer in my community is thinking about the different ways in which these different lab labels, um, how they suffocate our abilities to be our whole selves and what that physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually does to us on an individual, collective, and generational level. Um, and how we heal from all of that. So there's, there's manifestations of that. I think about fibroids that a lot of black women have that is intricately linked to um, the ability to not, be, to, to not be able to creatively express all of what you need to express about your power and yourself. I think about the increasing rates of suicide in our community. I think about the increasing rates of depression. And I think a lot of that is housed in, one, the, obviously the systems that be 
these systems of violence that impact us, and then also how we internalize all of those systems of violence and then get separated from who we are and not be able to see who we are and define who we want to be in this world. And that is traumatic. That is, that is a kind of trauma that plays out in um, how we see ourselves, how we treat ourselves, how we look at ourselves, and how we treat each other as a community, and how we build the kind of community that we need to be liberated and free. And so when I think about having continuing these conversations, I think about um, immediately starting with the, with the self first. You know, what is, what is, um, what are the questions that we're asking ourselves? You know, what are the spaces that we're creating our, for ourselves to be more intimate with who we are that really allows us to illuminate who we want to be that's outside of these normative boxes that don't always serve who we are? And how could we continue at every given moment that we can have these conversations, create these spaces with ourselves, and then ripple that on out into the different communities that we occupy? So the, the churches, our schools, our um, children, our everything, every single space that you can think of, um, so that this, this conversation doesn't only exist within these particular realms, but they really go into all the different spaces that we occupy. Um, I got into the ringtone, sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, Raven Simone. <laughs> You know, the thing about labels is that it's not even about the label, it's about the option of being able to choose the label if you so please. You know what I mean? Like, I just want to have the label there if I feel like having a label, you know? And I want to be able to, if I feel like saying I'm a diva, say I'm a diva. The real freedom is in having the choice to define yourself in any way that you want so that you don't get fibroids. Uh, and so that you aren't marginalized, and so that you aren't suppressed, et cetera, et cetera. Not everybody wants to be a diva, and that's cool. Um, but I think that there's a beauty in the option, in having the option to be. You know, I think that's really what this conversation it was, was really helpful to me about, like defining like, you know, where that lives and being able to choose like how you want to breathe into that space or not breathe into that space and that's fine too. And you know these conversations happen with ourselves. They happen at real kitchen tables without mics, you know. They happen on Twitter, they happen on Facebook that you know I find it fascinating that I went viral this week for being what some would say is a diva, like for being like, "Oh, hey, I'm not a white man," you know, and and that to me was like really major just to see that like our society will still share a woman for being smart, funny, and black. Like that will willingly share that amongst each other because amongst each other because I had become very frustrated when I would talk to young women to try and tell them, like if you just have your integrity, you're gonna make it. Because because when you look at the mainstream images of what make it looks like. A lot of times, like, that isn't, like, we're not there. You know, like, we're not in those mainstream images. Making it is like, I'm on TV, or I got, did you see how many likes I got on my selfie, though? Like, that's, for a lot of women, that's making it. So I just, I, so I, I just feel like it's important to have these conversations because of the guidance that we have to give, right, our, our youth, and because of the context that we give each other as adult women as well, because I know a lot of, peers that I'm like, why is this your choice? You know, like this, <laughs> she side-eyed, she's like, girl. Yeah. Um, so I just say all that to say that I think it's beautiful that we come here and that we have these discussions and, and I really liked this long table format, right? Um, <laughs> I, because, I, because a lot of times when you do these panels, you just feel like, you know, you're just like talking at folks and you know, none of us up here, well, I'm just gonna take a leap of faith that none of us up here feel like we are the be all end all of knowledge on, on any of these things. And you know, we are all a part uh, of- uh, no. 
<laughs> you know? But we are all a part of this community. We are all a part of this community. And for, for change to happen, it has to be communal. You know, for change to happen, there's, there are leaders, but for leaders, you know, intentions to, to be applied in practicum, there have to be people there who are doing that on a daily basis. And so I appreciate you all being here to even acknowledge, you know, your interest in this topic and our expertise in talking about it. And um, today, I have decided to choose the label diva. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow, I'll just be, all right, you know? But thank you all. Um, thank you very much. Uh, these conversations are really generative for me. Um, and I feel like I end up leaving with a lot more questions um, and answers, and I think that's really good, because I shouldn't leave with answers, because that would mean that, that would mean a lot of things. Um, so one of the things I'm really curious about after this conversation is whether the work around renaming and reclaiming is the most urgent work, um, and whether it's the work that, is it the right work? Um, and that's the question that I had during this whole conversation on language um, and who is a diva and what is a diva. Um, and then just thinking back to my interest being in just subjectivity and humanity and who gets to be a human being and who doesn't get to be a human being. And that at the end of the day, I was going to bring a great until you stole my radio. You got it. <laughs> um, but the thing that was interesting to me about that um, was this issue of choice but was also this assumption that all black women at all points in time have to move at the same pace, same movement, same everything, at the same, we don't get to be individual people. So I'm really interested in like, what does it mean to be an individual black woman who can express herself as she chooses to express herself without having a uh, storm of criticism because in that particular moment we chose to be an individual, but what does it also mean for us to collectively have humanity to be treated as human beings and not objects? Um, and whether or not that can come out of renaming or whether or not that comes out of structural shifts. There's a lot of moving parts, right? Um, and so that's what that conversation was about for me, and I think that as far as where these conversations happen um, outside of this space, I think one thing that's really awesome for this city, I think, is how many times you can have conversations with strangers, and I know friends might think that I'm crazy, but I talk to strangers all the time because we have the most amazing conversations so I think that like as one starting point thinking about starting with individual, like if you happen to have a conversation with someone on the street, really using that opportunity as an entry point to really delve into these issues because you never know what type of conversation you're gonna have and what can be generative out of that moment. Um, if you work in a school trying to make space to I mean common core. We have, there's a lot of space not to do these things, but I think there are a lot of openings. And so just using whatever openings are available to have those conversations um, as often, but not forgetting the action part and urgency of action. So let me just say, um, last night I was talking with Ebony, who uh, curated the brilliant vision for this and the other three things that are happening, about what her thoughts on this are. And one of the things that we said that we wanted to kind of invoke was um, how to get away from murder. Y'all remember when Viola Davis, those of you who watched that show or perhaps you saw this clip, had a moment where she was confronting an ugly truth, right? And what she decided to do in that moment was to strip her wig, strip her makeup, strip her jewelry, and be her most authentic self in that space. And that's sort of a metaphor, I think, for the kind of spirit that we wanted to bring into this space today with all of you classically beautiful people, <laughs> right? to begin to explore this conversation from our most authentic selves. And so I'd like to just thank each of our panelists and everybody who contributed to the conversation, whether you did that by coming to the mic or whether you did that from the energy that you gave in your seat. I think this was uh, an experiment for me. I haven't participated in this kind of conversation before, but I really enjoyed it because I think what it does, Amanda, like you were saying, is invert this idea that knowledge is ever simply just behind the microphone here, right? Like the people who are on this table are the only ones who know about the subject. Every time you come into a room, everybody's coming with their own knowledge, with their own experiences, with their own ideas. And I thank you for contributing them today. Um, I'd also like to make sure to thank 651 Arts. Shay and Candace and all of you brilliant people. 
I'd like to thank MAP International Productions. I want to thank the Brooklyn Museum for giving us this beautiful space. And in the vein of being in the museum, all of us on the panel are artists. We are photographers. We are performance artists. We began this conversation with art, and we're going to end it with art. So I'd like to ask you to welcome Amanda back to the stage for a performance. And when she finishes, we're going to have a reception outside of this area with DJ Val. So please stay for that. Continue the conversation here. And thank you so much for coming. So, uh, I, um, I'm a comedian, but I, I like to create some interesting spaces outside of just doing stand-up in the club, in, this, in the comedy club, and so I write these one-woman shows. And uh, three years ago, I wrote a show called Death of the Diva, which is where I challenge pop culture's portrayal of women one character at a time. And, uh, it, you know, so it makes sense why I'm on this panel. Uh, so, so in the show, I, I switch between narrative and character in acknowledging some different ways that I feel that like the image of the diva has been dismantled and turned into a negative way. You know, one of those ways is through uh, the marginalization of women in gangster rap, right? Where we just, all of us are hoes, all of us. Um, <laughs> according to gangster rap, all of you are hoes. Uh, <laughs> drop. Uh, just take it. Uh, you know, then there's also, uh, in the show, we also, I have, I play an executive who is, is talking to, a, you know, a possible performer that could be on their network, and she's basically saying, like, well, you know, if you're not crazy by the actual, like, clinical definition, or you're not willing to drop it, uh, we don't really have room for you right now. So, you know, come back when things change around. Um, but one of the other, one of the other characters in the show that I, and, and she speaks to one of the other ways that this positive uh, imagining of a diva has been dismantled is, an, is, is the performer, right? And um, I have performed with women who have been like, you really give a diva a bad name. Uh, and the, I don't think it's necessarily that they're trying to be negative. I think sometimes it's just, you know, you reach a certain point where you just don't care anymore because you've been through the fire. And uh, I would like to introduce you all to this character. Uh, her name is Odiva, and uh, she would like to share her story with you. Do you want to hear her story? Yes. Hit it! Hit it!
applause, ladies and gentlemen. Before we go out into the reception, I'd like to ask that we give the same amount of applause to the brother who's walking out of the room right now, Rasul. Whose idea this was. Thank you again for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at the reception.